Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone. We have folks joining us from all around the world today, and our panelists are spanning across an 11-hour time zone difference. So thank you to those of you who are joining us first thing in the morning. Thank you to those of you who are joining us in the evening at the end of your long day. We appreciate it. And on behalf of Stop Ecoside Canada, Stop Ecoside International, and Youth for Ecoside Law, we are very excited to be hosting this panel discussion today. My name is Dana Dolazar. I'm here representing Stop Ecoside Canada, and I'm calling in from the unceded Coast Salish territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam First Nations, on whose land I am very grateful to be able to live and play and do this work. Uh, I would just like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes before handing things over to John Woodside, who will be moderating this panel for today. Um, I will be monitoring the chat and we'll post in the chat our social media handles. So if you'd like to continue this conversation after the panel discussion ends, please follow us on our social media so that you are able to do that. Uh, I'm also going to post a link for those of you who are in Canada to our latest e-petition. If you are uh, interested in signing our e-petition, we would very much appreciate it. And if you would like to join our email list, please put your email into the chat. You're welcome to send it to me as a direct message if you like, but I will add you to our email list and keep you informed about any other upcoming events like this. Um, in regards to audience questions, we have a lot that we want to hear from our panelists, and we want to honor everyone's time by keeping this webinar to under 75 minutes, so we will likely not have time for audience questions. However, if you have a really good question and you want to write it in the chat, and there's an opportunity at the end, I will share your question with John, or perhaps your question will inspire our next conversation. Uh, so to start off this discussion, I would like to first talk to you about ecocide. There is a nature-sized hole in domestic and international law. At present, individuals are not held criminally liable when their actions have led to devastating widespread or long-term harm to the environment. We aim to change that with an international criminal law which is the governing, uh, under the Rome Statute, which is the governing document for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes of aggression. Ecocide is the fifth missing crime against peace. In 2023, new ecocide legislation was proposed or progressed across the globe, including in Brazil, Mexico, the Netherlands, Belgium, Spain, England, Scotland, Turkey, and... The European Union has just agreed to create a new dedicated offense aimed at criminalizing cases comparable to ecocide. The momentum behind this campaign to criminalize the mass destruction and damage of nature is growing fast. And we really hope that this discussion inspires you to learn more about ecocide law and to engage in further discussions like this, where we talk to people who have witness the destruction, people who are asking good questions, and people who are offering solutions. One such person is our moderator for today, investigative journalist for Canada's National Observer and recipient of a 2024 Canada Clean 50 Award, John Woodside. John Woodside's reporting has been critical in shining a light on the financial sector's role in fueling the climate crisis, Canada's role in climate diplomacy, and the politics of mega projects. Putting these issues front page, John's reporting has been cited in shareholder resolutions, contributed to policy changes, and even triggered a call from the White House to Ottawa. So John, welcome. Thank you for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me and um, and for putting this on. Uh, I also want to thank uh, everyone who's tuning in. Um, and uh, just before I introduce the panelists, I want to thank Stop Ecoside Canada for organizing this event. A lot of work has gone into this, and, and I'm really excited for the conversation that we're going to have. Um, you know, I don't need to tell the people here that climate change is a global problem. It's affecting every region of the world. Um, and, you know, where I am here in Ottawa, sometimes because of, uh, because of the politics of this city, the conversation 
feels like it's just on a policy level. And my point here isn't to downplay the important work happening on the policy level because we need serious, credible policies to deal with this. But ecocide, as we just heard, it's also a serious crime against humanity. Um, and we're long past the point of needing to recognize this. Um, but just like other crimes against humanity, the work isn't just about trying to codify this in international law. The goal is to stop it. Like that, That's kind of what we're all here for. So I sometimes like to think about these types of conversations that we're going to have today as uh, as a way to invite the future. And what I mean by that is when we look back on history, um, it didn't just happen, right? I mean, it, it was every single day that passed was a day that it was built. Um, it's the choices that we make. It's how we respond to what's going on around us. And every day that passes, we are building the future that we want. Now, unfortunately, it's not an equal world. Uh, some people in some places have more power than others, and there's a competition about what this future should look like. And because we live in that unequal world, uh, I really do commend everybody uh, who is here and is dedicated uh, to, to trying to better it. Um, that's everyone on this panel. Uh, everyone is working hard to find the weak points in the system to try to to try to generate change, and um, and that kind of collective action, uh, this sharing of expertise, uh, I think this is really really important for getting off of this just uh, this uh, kind of suicidal path that we're on. Um, so, with that in mind, I'm really excited to get this conversation. Uh, there's uh, going to be a lot to learn and a lot of ground to cover. And uh, we're also lucky enough to be having this conversation virtually. It's allowed us to have speakers from all over the planet join us uh, with people tuning in from all over the world too. And it's going to be a great opportunity to, to learn about our shared experiences, how they differ, how they're the same, and what we can do about it. So with that uh, said, on the panel today, we have uh, Dana Tizia Tram of the Gwich'in First Nations. Uh, he has advocated for environmental and species protection, indigenous rights, and renewable energy for the past decade. In addition to being the first indigenous chief to pass an emergency climate declaration, which set the precedent for the Council of Yukon First Nations and the Yukon and Canadian governments as a member of the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation. Uh, he has also negotiated an electricity purchase agreement to sell electricity back to utility companies, creating a paradigm shift in the traditional fiscal relationships and uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 680 tons per year. Dana also advocated at COP25, the Arctic Council, Assembly of First Nations, Council of Yukon First Nations, and others uh, incorporating renewable principles uh, of Indigenous ways of knowing and being um, when, when working to decolonize modern economies. We also have uh, Priyanka Lala, a 17-year-old child rights advocate from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, she's been a UNICEF youth advocate since 2020, focusing on children's rights to education, health, both physical and mental, child protection, and climate action. She's also a child's rights ambassador in Trinidad and Tobago. She's chair of the National Child's Rights Steering Committee. She's also a member of UNICEF's U Report main steering committee. She is a zero waste blogger and in 2022, authored and illustrated a children's book, Sfara's Ocean's Adventures, Ocean Adventures, pardon me. Uh, we also have Wasikam, a Turtle Clan Anishinaabe from Saugeen First Nation and the Kettle and Stony Point First Nations on the southeastern shores of Lake Huron. Uh, he is an avid paddler, having led four ceremonial canoe journeys throughout the Great Lakes to raise awareness about water, climate change, and Indigenous sacred responsibilities. His journey began in a response to the water walks, where he has been a protector and eagle staff carrier on seven walks. He is a coordinator for Seven Gen Energy, an Indigenous Youth Council committed to sustainable and equitable energy futures, empowering Indigenous communities to lead and live sustainable live sustainably, pardon me, through the intersection of energy, food, water, and the transition to a sustainable economy. He's also worked for the Chiefs of Ontario, for the Independent First Nations Organization, as well as working for both his ancestral communities. Wasikam was also a recipient of the Indian Collective Inaugural Changemaker Fellowship, recognized for his work in restoring Indigenous governance, water protection, and food sovereignty. His great passion is in building generational tools and agency for Indigenous-led nation building. It's a hell of a bio. Um, 
<laughs> everyone here has done so much. And finally, uh, last but not least, we've got Debbie Biaki, uh, is the co-lead for Youth for Ecoside Law and part of the core youth wing focused on strategy and policy. Her background is in criminal justice, criminology, and international law. She is a sustainability leader with United Peoples Global. In September of 2022, she served as a freshwater conservation researcher through National Geographic and the Nature Conservancy. Her uh, uh, Recently, uh, you've been a tree planter, founding a project that now covers six of the seven continents. Uh, and you produce a, and uh, she produces a podcast called Flight Over Nature, which you can find on any of your favorite platforms. Um, so, uh, as everyone I think can tell, we have got an incredibly, uh, incredibly smart, incredibly dedicated uh, group with us today. And um, starting us off, I'm going to ask uh, you, Dana, uh, to speak a little bit about uh, the changes that you're seeing in your territory from climate change, and then we can dig into some of the specifics a bit more. But but first, I'd love to hear that uh, big picture. Uh, what are you seeing? So I'm from the small village of Old Crow, Yukon, which is the most northwest settlement in Canada. We're about 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle, 60 miles east from the Alaska border. So this we're seeing um, four times uh, the change than the rest of the world. Um, I've recently moved from the community, but still in the Yukon. And before I had moved, we were seeing incredible things outside of the El Nino and El Nina cycles, such as having um, an inch and a half of snow in December. And as a young man, I was traveling on the land to find a campsite for my family so that I could set up my wall tent and, and get everything and start the fire so I could go back and get my family. I had to go back that day. We weren't able to go out. You can't set a tent in an inch and a half of snow. I could still see all the roots of the trees. We everything i've been seeing now my elders and what i keep hearing from them is i've never seen this before you know we have the black ducks coming before the geese what we call unluck and that's never happened before we've we've never seen that um all of the trees are slumping on our river sides we have cliffs that are falling we had an entire lake that uh, emptied out zelma lake it's now gone um, in the Yukon, uh, the year before last, we had an entire river that reversed its course. An entire river changed its direction because of a glacier melt in Kluwani Lake that finally gave way. And so the river changed its direction going the other way. Um, as I speak to you, it's plus two in the Yukon territory in, in, in March, which is unheard of as well. It rained in December, which, and we have to understand that all of these have chain effects. So when I was outside and I saw it raining in December, it shook me to my core because I knew that this was going to freeze and create a crust. That means owls and birds can't get at the voles underneath the Arctic foxes. Um, ungulates like moose and caribou cut their legs on the, it, it interrupts everything. And so when you see something like that, you know that the animals are not ready for it. We have bears that are waking up early that are wandering around like zombies confused in our forests because they're waking up early. And when you give the ecosystem a shake like this, you're going to have, let's say, anecdotally 30% that are going to die because they're not attuned for this. This hasn't happened before. And this is the generation. And I'm just one of the people who are showing you and telling you this has never happened before. We have not seen this and they have not seen it. And we don't have enough studies to actually quantify what this means. Can we like maybe then uh, talk a little bit about a specific example too, the uh, porcupine caribou herd? Um, you know, uh, as I understand it, there's proposed drilling in their calving grounds and, uh, you worked against this and even ended up speaking to the U S Congress about it. Uh, is that, can, can you tell us about that? Uh, what would that have done? Yeah, I think this is the ultimate act of, of ecocide, like a quintessential example and as an indigenous person, I'm I'm half German and half Gwich'in. So growing up, I never fit into either world. Like I'm vis visibly quite white. And so that taught me a lot about, you know, us as animals, human beings. But but never mind that. Um, I had to develop a language that 
translated indigenous principles and Western technicals. And I'll explain to you what, what I mean. So the caribou, they're the reason why we're, we've been there for 30,000 years. And the porcupine caribou today are the last land animal, largest land animal migration left on earth, which used to be the water buffalo in the Serengeti. No longer. It's now these caribou at 220,000 strong. They've been in this area for 2.1 million years, and they've chosen a specific coastal plain as their rearing or their calving grounds. And we know the deft way in which nature works. This area has cotton grasses that only grow in this area that are the most nutritious food that they have access to that they need for their milk. Also, because it's a flat plain by the ocean, there's constant breeze blowing the bugs off of them. And because it's a plain, they can see their predators coming from a far way. So it's it's the perfect area for them. And their birth and death rates are razor thin. It's about 6%. So it doesn't take much to knock this population into a steady decline. So it, it really is a finesse and a balance. So the United States is proposing drilling right in their calving grounds under the uh, Alaska National Interest Land Conservation Act, Section 1002, which is why they nicknamed it the 1002 lands, is these 1.2 million acres where these caribou calve. And we're trying to explain to them that this is this is ecocide, that you're going to destroy an entire system. So sitting down with an energy worker, flying from my community off the land onto a plane, ending up in Washington, D.C. within 24 hours, and then standing in front of a young man who's an energy and mines uh, advisor for their congressman, he was maybe 22 years old in a nice suit. And here I am coming out of the bush, and I looked at him and I thought, this guy has probably never even been camping. Like, how am I supposed to talk to him and make him understand the reality of this? Because if you look at this economically, this area is not producing anything. So oil and gas makes sense. But if you look at this through ecosystems, this is driving the heartbeat of the Arctic. It feeds polar bears, mosquitoes, and my people, everybody. It drives these systems. So sitting down with him, I had to figure it out in my head very quickly. And it gave birth to this new lexicon that I'm using. And I'll I'll share with you the story. I sat down with him and explained to him who I am, who I represent, and my family, my bloodlines, and where I come from. And that the voice that I'm speaking to him with and you with now is not mine. It was carried by my ancestors throughout the millennia and is the birthright of my grandchildren. So this is not about me. This is about our people and, you know, our, our relationship with our non-Indigenous peoples as well. And I told him that this area, and I'm asking him, what is this, what's actually happening here when these caribou calve and eat here? I said that the, the plants in this area are converting photons into nutrients and mineral, minerals through chloroplasts in, in their leaves and the foliage. And when the caribou eat this, they're converting them into nutrients and into proteins. And they deliver them across the Arctic like this ebb and flow of nutrients and energy. And they drive these renewable systems. And if you go in there and interrupt the system, you might get 10 years of gas out of this area, but you've now destroyed a renewable energy system that runs off of the sun. And I told him that if you choose to go ahead and do this, I am here on behalf of my people to let you know that we will be destroyed and our culture will be destroyed. But I said, moreover, we are a canary in the coal mine. And I'm here to tell you that if you, you're signaling something far more dangerous than my people's demise, but you're signaling to the world that we are willing to sell the infinite for the finite. And that is far more dangerous. And that speaks to ecocide, but moreover, the insatiable philosophies of monetary systems and um, um, our current economic practices. Yeah, uh, that's that's really fascinating. And I mean, I think like what I'm, one of the things I'm picking up in, in what you just described is... Uh, is the need for a paradigm shift, you know, in, in how, um, in, in how, uh, economies, uh, place value on, on different things. Um, and 
And, and, and with that in mind, I mean, I did just also want to ask about, you know, what might help bring about a paradigm shift like that? Um, what what kind of tools are are at our disposal or could be developed? And and it, it reminds me of this uh, artificial intelligence project that you're working on, um, where uh, gathering indigenous laws from around the globe in one place. Can you can you tell us more about this? Uh, why is this such an important project for you? I appreciate the question. Thank you. Uh, first of all, when we take an epistemological approach to this and to that question, epistemology being the study of what is truth and how do we know it to be true? I actually find the economy the perfect term. Um, the Latin derivative for economy is managing one's household. That's what the term terminologies were born from. And from an Amnesty International report, 80% of the world's biodiversity today rests in indigenous lands. And if we look at New York, you know, let's say in compared to Lake Titicaca, the uh, golden jewel of the Triple Alliance of the Aztecan Empire, Indigenous peoples are the ultimate economists. We are we manage our households very well. When you enter in corporations and corporate charters, which the eco side is to corral, uh, another way is having corporate charters revoked if they're sentenced to death. If corporations enjoy all the rights of human beings, and yet they can dump millions of barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico and walk away and continue doing business, the Corporate Act, in my opinion, is one of the greatest linchpins in, in losing control over uh, from the industrial revolution so if eco um, economies are you know predicated on the gdp and i just want to say that this stuff sounds very fancy and high level but it's really not actually in every economic textbook they talk about some kind of mysterious prehistoric civilization where we bartered things with one another you have a spear i have a beaver skin we agree it's a good trade boom Actually, anthropological studies show that this was not the first economies. They were gift economies. I had 10 beaver skins. Other people didn't. So I only needed three and I would give them out. And then those families would know that I gave them something. So when they had something, they would, this is how we naturally worked. So this economy today is really a perversion of our natural inklings. So how do we take this back? Because going through the tax act, going through the corporate act and understanding these things is very difficult. There are innovative solutions like um, social entrepreneurship or First Nation entrepreneurship, where a corporation's profits are measured in impact to the society or to people. Um, but those, let's say, aren't being practiced by the big guys and Apple, et cetera. So one of the <clears throat> also important processes of this, and I see my people as holding on to teachings that we all used to have. It's just my people never lost those teachings. And the land does not care whether you're a muskrat, a moose, or a man. All your teachings are the same, and they're just not in English. I call it the language before words. And there's a reason why nature banks on diversity and rewards cooperation across species, across everything. And we don't necessarily harness or bank that. So just like ecocide and getting into the system and changing it within, which is the healthiest way, um, we're now utilizing um, a uh, cutting edge artificial technology, which is cut off from the internet. So it's not influenced by Google. It's not influenced by YouTube. It was trained on that but it doesn't have access to them. And we create an AI environment where we've now fed this um, AI um, indigenous agreements. In Canada, we've settled our land and rights agreements with the Crown so we can have our own government. We can create our own land acts. Uh, this is the cutting edge of uh, indigenous agreements in the world. But yet after 30 years, we haven't drawn down a single jurisdiction just because we have these agreements doesn't mean the movie ends. And when people are speaking of indigenous peoples, we hear of self-determination a lot. That's what indigenous peoples are after, self-determination. Well, we cannot address self-determination until we look at self-reliancy. 
And even as a modern treaty holding First Nation, I can tell you when we are not holding or practicing these things and we still have to go to the government for even permission to draw it down, that still is not happening. So we are utilizing AI technology to cut through all law, policy, and regulatory regimes. And with the systems that we are creating, specifically First Nations, um, they are able to process hundreds of land infractions, um, and this machine can put them through with uh, laws in mind, and it has no opinion, and it can categorize them for their teams of lawyers. So now their team can do uh, what would take them three months in a week, because this machine can categorize all the land infractions, show which area they've infracted, um, based on their past reports, what the machine may categorize them in this period, but it can do this for uh, many more more things. We can now create programs that could educate every single employee in a territorial, provincial, or federal government about Indigenous rights in a single day. We can also create a program based off of the United Nation Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and create a system that is to educate other colonial governments such as New Zealand, Australia, or others. And this program can be accessed by your phone created by Indigenous peoples for Indigenous peoples and for rights and for the land. However, the important caveat is we have to put a layer on it, and our company is currently the only one in the world that is known right now that is doing values-based AI. So we ensure that there are documents from First Nations that lead to how these documents are to be interpreted so as to not be weaponized against First Nations, because this is a reality that we see in Canada and around the world um, to Brazil, where Indigenous leaders are being assassinated by logging companies, to Wet'suwet'en First Nation in Canada, where the Canadian RCMP basically a, a federal agency acted as a military bodyguard for an industrial pipeline invading indigenous sovereign territories within our own country, which is still happening today. So this is about putting the imbalance of power back to the people and AI technology should be driven by grassroots principles, not mega corporations. But it is incredible to speak to you today as a person who has one generation left the land to now working with AI technologies to honor the principles my grandfather learned growing up on it. Thank you for sharing all that. That's uh, such an interesting project. And um, uh, if, if there's more time, I'd be asking you a lot more follow-ups on that, but, um, but, but thank you. Um, uh, at, at this point in the conversation, I want to move this to, uh, to Priyanka. Um, and and really starting at the beginning of your journey into climate uh, leadership, can you tell us about the hurricanes that hit the islands where you live? Um, you know, how old were you? Uh, what, what was that like? How did it push you into into doing what you do now? Absolutely. Well, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to join you all today on this panel, Ecocide and Environmental Racism. Thank you for this question and thank you for the opportunity to share. So my advocacy journey actually began at the age of 10 after Hurricanes Irma and Maria hit the Leeward Islands. I was devastated by the vast destruction on islands so close to home. And I knew what natural disasters were. I knew that they existed, but I only felt, but it only felt real and it only felt, you know, present when I saw the impact of it in my region and on islands so close to home. And while I had not felt the physical impact of these hurricanes in my country, Trinidad and Tobago, I had felt and witnessed the impact of flash flooding. In a primary school I once attended, we experienced a flash flood where the entire school was washed out. While the students belonged to more affluent families and the physical recovery of the school was fast, the mental and mental well-being and mental health of some of these children was affected as many became anxious and nervous whenever it rained. But throughout the country, 
These flash floods have created enormous disruption, especially to the impacted families, the majority of whom come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And this precarious position leaves parents cash strapped and unable to provide for their families. The floods put them at further risk for both vector and insect borne diseases. And often children would lose, would be separated from their parents. They would lose time out of school, infringing their right to education. They would lose their belongings, including school books and uniforms. And the process to reconstruct their lives is extremely difficult. Every aspect of a child's life is affected by the climate crisis. Their family unit is disrupted and consequently their safety their access to education, their nutritious meals, their ability to access nutritious meals, healthcare, and their overall well being. And it's not surprising that many children in this group are afflicted by one or more non communicable diseases. Child obesity, diabetes, hypertension, fatigue, and even depression are directly related to their poor diets and their living conditions. One of the reasons for the flash floods is the inadequate drainage and dumping in the already limited waterways. But we don't have time for the blame game. We, we can only work and act in solidarity to build a more sustainable and a more resilient country and a more resilient region. And more than anything, I felt empowered and curious, especially at such a young age. My curiosity led me to finding the answers for questions like what caused this or what was the human impact that resulted in such an atrocity? And the answers to these questions were not accessible in social media, traditional media, or even in the curriculums in schools at the time. So I created a zero waste blog and my research led me to many solutions and showed me that we don't need to reinvent solutions because the solutions already exist when it comes to adapting to sustainability because, you know, the practices that we can implement into our daily lives, such as green skills and such as changing our habits to work towards a zero waste life and work towards that circular economy are available and are accessible and even affordable. We just need to implement it. So the mission of my zero waste blog and my zero waste lunch kit campaigns created hope that we do in fact have the power to create change. And while we do require more than individual action on a community level or a national or regional level, my 10 year old self did not need others to change first. And I think that this is a narrative that is uncommon in our societies today. For example, I did a focus group with students ages 14 to 16, and the results showed that they believe that they have absolutely no power or impact when it comes to mitigation or adapting to the climate crisis. They believe that it is purely in the hands of larger companies and the governments. And while we do need those sectors to likewise change their practices and their policies, we are not fighting the climate crisis to our full potential if we don't believe that we too have power. So my advocacy is focused on youth empowerment. So far, I'm the author of two children's books, Zvara's Ocean Adventures and Zvara's Mangrove Adventures, which are both targeted towards children the ages three to nine to teach them about the climate crisis in our region in a fun and interactive way. And this is my main motivation to advocate that the climate crisis is a child rights crisis. And this is why I collaborate with Stop Ecocide, as it's the only way to not disappoint the generations who will inherit this planet. Um, I think you also mentioned an oil spill. Environmental degradation is ongoing. The recent oil spill in Tobago is a massive blow to the island's ecosystems. I have not witnessed the extent of the damage to the beaches, the reefs, the mangroves or the dive spots in person. But I do know that this will affect the livelihoods of those in tourism and fisher folk and their children. And this will have a domino effect leading to a host of challenges, including economic to health issues for a long time to come. Between 2015 to 2023, we've actually had around 876 oil spills in Trinidad and Tobago, according to the EMA, but there was little attention brought to the public by publications or broadcasted on our media. 
These environmental tragedies are consistently brushed aside or forgotten about, and these issues cannot be addressed by the authorities alone. Solidarity is the only way forward, as we all are affected and should be included in safeguarding our future. So thank you for Stop Ecocide for including me today. Thank you for that. That is, um, I'm sort of blown away by that figure you just gave of how many spills there are. Um, you know, one, I guess one, one thing that, um, that I was reminded of uh, in that answer that you just gave, um, last year I was fortunate enough to go to Haida Gwaii. Uh, it is the home of the Haida Nation uh, off the coast of present day British Columbia. And, uh, and I was out there to, to, to speak with the nation's leadership about, about sovereignty, about marine conservation, about the threat of LNG traffic uh, with a, a potential boom in LNG shipping. And, and one of the things that came out in that story was 10 years ago, there was a ship that lost power while it was at sea. And uh, a strong ocean current was blowing it to shore. And if it hit shore, um, I mean, it would have been it would have been a catastrophe. And and hearing and when and, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because there's a vulnerability um, that comes from uh, uh, from being an island in the ocean at risk of at risk of these things. And that vulnerability, I think, is a is a really it, it really speaks to the the need to like seriously talk about ecocides um where these threats come from and 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 the reason i want to just highlight that story is is to help draw the link between the shared problems um th that are experienced i mean uh where trinidad tobago is far from uh far from high to Gwai, but similar types of threats uh, at play Another type of threat that is absolutely everywhere I wanted to be sure to ask you about is, is plastics. You know, often when we talk about ecocide, people think about the big one-off moments like the oil spills or the uh, dumping waste, um, but that's that's only part of it. Uh, can you share with us your thoughts about how plastics are related to human rights and specifically the rights of children? Absolutely, thank you for this question. I definitely believe that this is an issue that is critical as many do not understand the correlation between plastics and human rights. In our region, for instance, and in my own country, this is a common feature for consumers. Plastics are engraved into our culture, and I sometimes think that we do not even know that it's harmful or know the effects or the extents to it. For instance, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have a dominant and accessible fast food industry where you can find a fast food outlet at almost any point in the country. Our supermarkets are filled with highly processed and plastic packaged goods. Fruits and vegetable in grocery stores are wrapped in plastics, even things like bananas and cucumbers. And school com competitions and sporting competitions are always sponsored by these companies. So after running a 300 meter race in primary school, you can be sure that you will be greeted with a box of fried chicken and a sugary beverage in a plastic bottle afterwards. And the impact of these high levels of plastic consumption does not only pollute our nation and our waters, but it also has an incredibly dangerous impact on the health of our people. We have opted for the convenience of plastics, especially in fast food meals and meals to the uh, meals on the go, packaging and bags from supermarkets and other shops at our peril of our and our well-being. And apart from the proliferation of plastics, we grapple with the poor disposal and limited recycling of plastics. And the evidence of this is the plastic water bottles that come up with the frequent flash floods, thousands of plastic bottles washed up. And not only do these bottles clog the waterways and contribute to the devastation of flooding, they chemically pollute water and land ecosystems. Currently, approximately 99% of plastics are produced from fossil fuels. 16 fossil fuel extractions affects 
the wide range of human rights. And many people, especially those who live in informal communities, are affected when their water sources and their land around their home are filled with plastic pollution. Plastic pollution affects children, women, pregnant and older people due to the biological factors. Education is key for people to understand the health risks of endocrine disrupting chemicals, including BPA. And we may not be aware that the quality of air that we breathe cannot affect can also affect um, newborn babies or that Asthma is a chronic problem among many children and young people and exposure to chemicals may lead to harmful effects that do not appear until puberty or adulthood. Older people are also particularly affected as the human body ages, changes in organs functioning may also make it harder for people's bodies to process environmental pollutants, including toxins emitted during plastic recycling. A slower metabolism coupled with earlier life exposure can lead to pollutants remaining in older people's bodies for longer periods of time than younger adults, increasing their exposure to these toxins. Plastics are also dumped in landfills and they naturally break down into microplastics, as we know. And this gets into soil, water, air and ultimately the bodies of our wildlife and our human bodies. Sometimes methods to dispose of plastics, such as incineration, contribute to harmful chemicals being released in the air. And this is the reality in Trinidad and Tobago. This is visible for all to see. There are large clouds of smoke over the main landfill that enveloped the entrance to the capital that release harmful chemicals and pollutants, inhibiting the health of many people. And this practice has become acceptable and public discussion is limited. This is why I strongly believe in education and climate education. So I can tell you a little bit about my initiative. Uh, my initiative Zero Waste Lunch Kit um, was designed to reduce plastics. No plastics at all, no single use plastics in the lunch kit in elementary school, middle school. And I started this initiative in my own school. This practice must be ingrained from a young age. And that's why I started it at my own school to lead by example and show that it can be done. It's easy, it's accessible, and it's affordable. My first book, Zvara's Ocean Adventures, focuses on the impact of microplastics and how plastic consumption can be reduced or eliminated. The book, as I mentioned, is written for children ages three to nine, and it's fun, it's interactive, and it looks at my little sister, Zvara, who swims around the Caribbean Sea, speaking to various aquatic creatures that live in our waters, such as the strawberry grouper. And the animals share their challenges with being caught in plastic bags and bottles and how difficult it is becoming for them to survive. And they ask Zvara to help them to teach humans how to stop plastic and how to stop using plastic, because ultimately, we are all affected. Humans likewise are affected. And the contaminants affect our right to quality, air quality, um, healthy ecosystems to grow our food, agriculture. When plastic packaging flows through our waterways, it threatens biodiversity by polluting natural habitats, endangering wildlife and contributing to climate change. So this is my connection between plastics and human rights in Trinidad and Tobago and in my region and an initiative that I have created to in, in kind of instituted from a younger age, because as we all know, it really is, <clears throat> excuse me, important to implement it at that primary level. Our kids, our children are such curious thinkers and they too deserve the right to know what's happening and more importantly, how they can adapt, how they can mitigate and how they can feel empowered to act more than burdened or more than feeling hopeless. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I mean, if there's time later, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the plastics treaty that's being negotiated right now. Um, that's, uh, I'm sure people on the line would have interest in that. But um, but I do want to be cognizant of time because uh, uh, we're already coming up on it. Um, and oh, Wasikam, I wanted to ask you about, um, about your canoe journeys. Um, as I understand it, the longest one you've been on uh, lasted 92 days. 
Uh, and and while canoeing, you observe multiple issues that I think are are relevant to the conversation we're having today. Um, so so can you tell us about um, why like why you went on this journey uh, and, and what you saw? Yeah, well, first of all, good morning. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, and in my language, I just let you know where my spirit makes its sound from, the Sagin River. And also, my name is Wasekom. It means the light that looks like daylight or the lightning that, you know, fills the sky for that moment and everything lights up. Uh, and you can see just like daytime. That's uh, my name. And uh, I'm Turtle Clan Anishinaabe from the southeastern shores of Lake Huron. Um, and I grew up in both of my parents' communities. And um, yeah, it, it was kind of a really crazy endeavor, I would say, um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, because it, in my culture, like we kind of, our uh, culture of canoeing is kind of at rest. It's not quite active as it once was. So there was this embedded fear within our people to go out and be on the big water and when i say the great lakes um they're more like inland seas they're not quite lakes they're massive bodies of water and so um you know it, it's big water and um i was brought along a, another journey called the water walk um a number of years before and got to walk every day for hundreds of kilometers over the course of uh, a month and um, to raise awareness about the water. And it's like a First Nations led ceremony. And my late mother, Josephine Mandaman, uh, started those journeys. And I was inspired by like, you know, how when people say it's such a small world, but really it's not, it's a big, beautiful world that's so full and it, when we're driving around we don't we miss we miss everything we barely see anything and when we trade that convenience of getting somewhere sooner we we miss out on the story the relationships you know all these um experiences these uh opportunities to observe hey eh? <clears throat> and uh so when i when i um by the time i i paddled across the great lakes i've actually done five major canoe journeys and they're uh, a ceremony and it starts really simple with a question uh what more like this big journey we did it said what more must we do for the water to turn things around for the water um and i come from a place where there's water on all sides of us not quite in an island but we're connected to uh three of the major great lakes and uh my my community's home territory Host the world's largest outputting nuclear generating facility, the Bruce Nuclear. Um, our community also has to decide whether or not to accept uh, a deep geologic repository for nuclear waste uh, um, for all of Canada's high level nuclear waste. So it's a big catch 22, and our people never consented to the creation of this energy production in our territory, but we're being left with the bill of all of this waste that will last anywhere from 150,000 to a million years. So I'm no stranger, like growing up, I was no stranger to these very big, complex uh, in environmental um, considerations. And um, I'm just going to touch, this is sort of like a little bit of a background before I go into the, what I've seen on this journey, informing this journey, because um, at home, we, we live in a state of perpetual uh, systemic impoverishment, you know, in our survival, and uh, yet we're being brought these very complicated matters, right? So I sort of grew up in that world. And by the time I came up and um, had started taking action for the land and for the water, um, and then later into uh, these uh, Indigenous sovereignty and generational toolmaking, um, you know, I was very much raised in an environment where um, like these these stark realities were right there. You can't not see them. And as Anishinaabek people, like I was brought up uh, understanding that we are responsible for the seven generations, the three behind us, the three ahead of us, and ours today. Beyond that, we're it's not our place to make decisions that would impact beyond that, you know. And yet 
in all these major proposals and and in the context of ecocide you know as soon as something big happens like that and there are these massive impacts that ripple out beyond you know and so it's not our place as people as human beings and in our ways that's the realm of the animals the trees the water itself the land itself and there are ways to be in relationship to understand what kind of project or what kind of thing we can do in this area where is it most ideal for this to take place like if we listen and follow that you'll know you'll be able to find where things can happen and simply where they're not going to happen <clears throat> anyway so um i was compelled after going on this water walk and doing my first uh, canoe journey um, from my my dad's home community, and it was a, my my initial journey was a twenty eight day journey that followed the moon cycle up to our nation's homeland. Um, it's a place called Sault Saint Marie, where uh, three of the Great Lakes meet. And um, on that journey, I got to see like, whoa! It takes it takes uh, about half an hour, like a half an hour's drive on the Great Lakes is about how much you could paddle in one like eight to ten hour period of time. So it's a it's a a lot in one day, and at that time I just jumped, just grabbed my canoe, like the little bit of gear that I had, and I just went for it, you know. And like I grew up on the water, but I was never like an avid paddler, and um, it was more so this I was compelled in my spirit, in my heart, in my being to do more. Like what more can we do? And I was led to the canoe because the canoe is a ve a vehicle is our vehicle that came to our people, you know, and it's a part of who we are. And it's one of those, it's yet one of those other things that fell away as we had to, as our way of life was disrupted and we had to adapt to this new way of being. So um, I called my journey, picking up the bundles canoe journey. We're picking back up the bundles that were left to us by our ancestors. And um, my late mother, Josephine, in the winter of, um, 2018 or 2017 called me and she said i'm gonna do my final water walk and i'm gonna walk from duluth minnesota following tracing the great lakes out all the way to the saint lawrence seaway uh in a pl little place called maten quebec and it's the on the south shores of of the saint lawrence and i'm, I'm gonna ask for some of your time i i want um I want to ask you for some of your time and so i said oh yeah for someone like you for sure because she was a really per like amazing person and i could spend this whole time just talking about her her message and her work and her legacy and it was about to love the water which is to love ourselves you know because we are water also and to take care to pick up those responsibilities and um so i said for someone like you of course i'm gonna i'm gonna give you any time you need, she's how much time do you need? Oh, about four months, <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh, okay, well, what do you, what do you want? Eh? And she's, yeah, well, come, come with us, you know, and bring your, bring the canoe. And um, so I got, got busy. And by April of that next year, we were off on this, this, this crazy, like when I look, look back at it, it was, it was wild. It took me two years to recover emotionally spiritually mentally physically um like it felt like a really big sacrifice for me um and when from the eastern side of the great lakes as you move or sorry the western side of the great lakes as you move east the further east you go it's like you can see the story of colonization of this continent what happened you know and, and at least in the context of canada what happened hey and so you could go to this beautiful and somewhat pristine area in the north and west side of Lake um, Superior. As you travel that, it's like, you know, big boulders and big trees and clean water. As you get more east, it's like the trees disappear and then there's farms, there's major quarries, there's these nuclear plants. Like I've paddled around all of the nuclear plants and um, like you have to paddle two kilometers outside of the intake valves because every seven seconds, like an Olympic size swimming pool is siphoned out of Lake Huron's body used to keep the reactors cool. Right. It's an insane amount of water. And if you get too close, you'll get literally sucked in, you know? So like there, and 
um, by the time we were getting kind of more south and Lake Erie is one of considered like an impaired Great Lake and is really only able to sustain life for about three months out of the year. The year that I was uh, paddling through there, there was a fracking spill in Ohio and a tailing a tailing spawn uh tailings pond spill and the the yeah the fracked water got into the lake and it killed over 70,000 fish at least that's what they could estimate so it was also during the season of the algal blooms and if you've ever been on like Erie there's like 8 to 10 foot algal like these huge blobs that are just growing from the excess nutrients in in the lake so it was like this green uh, and then film. There was a film on the water, like an oil slick film. And there were so many dead fish all along the beaches. Some In some areas, they were just stacked on each other everywhere. Like you couldn't. And we tried to count them along the beaches. And we literally couldn't even keep, keep count of how many that we. And by this point on the journey, by the, when you spend so long out, out on the water, um, eventually become like the water you know and it was like I could and as this um, as the forest disappeared and the, and the wild spaces disappeared it's like there's only little there's only little places you can go where there's nature and in certain areas the level of racism it was there was like a correlation to like this native people surrendered their land this is our land now you need to this is private property this shoreline which is a navigable right like we have a right of access and a, a right of transportation like that's these are values that founded this country right through the canoe and here we are just going along in a peaceful way praying for the water educating people sharing our message and yet we were we would run into people that would try to go up and get their gun and tell us to leave our own land you know so at a certain point we ended up traveling at night through these areas, like areas that we knew that were really racist. We would just go around them quietly at night. And that that was something that our ancestors did back in the 1800s in this very area of the uh, where this all this trouble was taking place. And then, you know, over the generations, just cut all the trees down and the way that they're doing agriculture is causing the algal blooms, right? Like it's so, um, there's so many intrinsic links between like racism, environmental racism, ecocide, and in the way that I experienced it primarily was it's a slow, it's like a slow accumulative death, right? And, and it's like, there's all these little things that you can't see but you can see them. And that's what the way that I come at this is like from the water. When we're on the water, we're seeing things the way that they're meant to be viewed. Like that that viewpoint is really important. And as Indigenous people, I, I believe that, that this is part of one of the ways that we have to uphold our responsibilities um, is to actually go and look for ourselves and go and, go and take the time to really, when there are these megaliths of these projects or there's these tiny little cumulative effects that become bigger things or what whichever way that this is taking place we have we can't not look at it we have to go and look at it and sit with it and really if we're going to take responsibility for the land and for the water we have to find a way through the trouble to this other side and um and that's kind of where i spend most of my time now is like so after this long voyage you know i could i could go and show and point out all the areas along this this pathway where i experienced like ecocide you know like various examples different forms of ecocides within the great lakes watershed um you know one of the one of the biggest things that i i sort of learned is yeah like the the responsibilities that that it requires for us to like address this repair it and so um, it, it really brought me into this movement of generational tool making and, um, and then showing up in this really cross um, sectoral way. So I don't really do work in one area. It's like I find ways to work in many areas and to start tying them together because it's sort of like if we don't look at these things or if we don't address these systemic things, we'll always be there praying for the water that it will get well again, you know, without addressing the 
the fundamental behavior that's causing causing this you know and, um yeah so I, I could stop there and say thank you uh, that, uh you know i there's so much in your answer that i appreciate and um and i want to thank you for for sharing all that um and you know especially one of the things that i want to, to highlight as a you know as a general takeaway uh from from what i heard is um it's just how important it is to emphasize that ecocide uh has all these other dimensions to it that go beyond just the environment in a very narrow way right it's the it's the cultural impacts it is the spiritual impacts um the the intrinsic links that you described i think are like a really central part of this conversation so i want to thank you for for really drawing that out i think it's really helpful and it's also um I think it's also a really uh, good way to sort of bring in the uh, to, to to bring in Debbie to to uh, speak a little bit about um, about her podcast, Flight Over Nature: Stories of Africa, where culture, climate change, and conservation are are talked about and intersect. And uh, and, and I'm going to throw it to you, Debbie, to to tell us about how culture intersects with climate change, but um but but i also just want to like make this point that uh that kind of wherever you are in the world i mean we're seeing these these links um we're seeing these links affected we're seeing uh attempts at building them back and strengthening them and uh i think this is a really good opportunity to uh to hear about the commonalities and differences so yeah over, over to you debbie how does how does culture intersect with climate change hi i i think it's very honorable to speak after the, the speakers who've gone before me and listen to their stories and tap into their wisdom. And so how culture and climate change intersect is something I like to call the three C's and that the third C is conservation. And the episode was recorded, of course, in an African context, and I'll proceed uh, to explain it that way. So culture is the way of life and how we do things, how we exist somewhere and how we relate to the things around us so how we relate to the water bodies how we relate to the mountains how we relate to our farms to the people and so on that's our way of life and of course in cities these days this kind of sounds a bit far-fetched and but that culture is still what is being developed so how do people in the city relate to the plastic in the fast food or how do they relate to their neighbor when they walk out and dash to work? So that is the culture that's being built in cities and in outside cities. Let me say outside cities. So it's how we build that way of life consistently every day. And to narrow it down, of course, because this was given in the African context, is the conservation, which um, I'd like to explain. It's something that's more of etched in our way of life. So conservation and climate change and culture is something we do. And it's this much uh, coincidental type of thing that we have it as well engraved in our laws. So, for example, in Rwanda, every for every tree that you cut, you have to plant 10. And that's a law. And every last Saturday, there is a whole general cleaning that happens, and including the president. He's usually out in the streets sweeping and cleaning the dirt and planting trees with the people, cleaning the lake. So it's it's the way of life, but it's also a law. It's in, it's become so usual that it's now a law. And it's something that we're also seeing being taken up in different areas of Africa. And the AU has also passed something in 2021, a directive to have um, the trees in Congo replanted by everyone. So it's that conservation is our way of life. And we're trying to see um, lots of things also happening in West Africa with having, for example, fruit trees. And this is something that was talked about in that episode, having fruit trees um, in your compound. It's not mandatory, but it's your culture. So it's something we try to do in Africa and explain it to our children as practice, not only as words, but doing it to engrave it in them as Priyanka said uh, and kids for sure are the gateway to everything you tell a child to you teach them in school something because I work with uh, kids in tree planting you 
teach them something and they'll go tell their mom and their mom will tell the people at work and the people at work will tell someone. So it, children are really the gateway to change. And that's something I think we can really tap into, even as we try to preserve, to conserve all these degraded lands, we need to involve the children. So I think climate change and culture through conservation is something as delicate as taking care of your hair. Every day you try to wash it and clean it. It's something you do. It becomes part of you. And probably that's uh, the answer I would give to that. Um, so uh, I want to be cognizant of time here too, because I want to make sure that we kind of cover everything. But, um, you know, I, I want to ask about the UN's Environment Assembly uh, that uh, met in Nairobi recently. And, um, you know, so this would be a space where countries are coming together to negotiate responses to climate change, nature loss, pollution. Um, but, but I'm curious, you know, uh, what, what did you observe in those meetings? Um, and, and, and do you get a sense of are issues that are important to Africa being overlooked in this international system? Um, not sure if those go together in your mind or if those are separate, feel free to handle, uh, feel free to tackle it however you like, but curious what you think. Right. So I think that's like, uh, as well, a two part question. So the UN Environment Assembly is the highest decision-making uh, body and table when it comes to environmental matters. And it was held in Nairobi from the last week of February to the first week of March. And one thing I really like to applaud as well as um, push forward to other meetings we see with the UN and other high-level decision-making tables is we had a huge presence of children and we had notable voices of the youth being accepted and being called upon to this decision-making table, which is the highest of the world. It doesn't happen that way a lot in the UN processes and with uh, as well the cops. We don't see children at all. Sometimes like in Dubai, we didn't see, I don't think I even saw a child for two weeks, but um, in this process, we had children actually speak on the stages. We had children write drafts to the head of the UN environment um, Actually, the whole UN Nairobi office, we had children submit drafts to them. So that's something I really noticed that was unique with that. And as I said, the next generations are our legacy and something that Wasikom also referred. It's the three generations behind us, as well as the ones before us, that we need to take responsibility for currently. So having the voices of the people who, in, who will inherit the decisions we're making now also feature in these decisions is something I found quite unique with UNE and I think I would applaud as well as continue to encourage such um, presence, even in our conservations that we must involve children. We must teach them from a young age that this is how you take care of your environment. This is how you relate to it. You don't throw plastic like that. You don't cut trees like that. So I think engraving it in them from a young age is something we need to start and maybe also stop overlooking. And when it comes to the question on um, how I think Africa was or is being overlooked, I think overlook is such a strong word. I think ignored uh, would be a lesser word to describe it. And of course, many things continue to happen in Africa, both um, good and bad, but seemingly sometimes this is subject to what mainstream media approaches of Africa. But I think uh, some things are just intentionally ignored and overlooked. But however, I think Africa continues to build itself and to reinvent itself. And we're seeing such huge shifts uh, in decisions being made in Africa. And this is on the backdrop of colonialism. So recently, a few years back, maybe two, three years, uh, Niger also, many countries have done this, but... Niger took the lead to increase the price of its minerals. It has great minerals. Uh, I, can, I forget the name, but it has a mineral that's quite important in nuclear formation or something like that. So recently we saw it actually increase the price of what that is because uh, in the past it was determined by what colonial agreements were signed by chiefs who didn't even understand what they were doing. So I think it's reinventing itself and... It's also changing the rules of what is brought into its markets and scrutinizing it more. And something that we're also seeing is 
the embrace of environmental law and I would lean now towards eco side. Of course, we thought, uh, we think sometimes the ICC is a racist court because most of the people prosecuted are Africans. But the embrace of this law will now shift that balance and have it um, described as something that we see will bring power back to Africa. It will tell those polluters from outside and the multinationals how far you can come. You can't cut this thousands of acres of trees anymore. You can't dump that here anymore. So I think the ecocide law is coming in to shift that balance and see how the African voice still can be um, can be represented in things that involve their own lands. And we know, for this is something I talk about sometimes, uh, most of the minerals, we keep talking about the just transition, but most of the minerals required for the just transition are located in Africa. So we have cobalt, which is something we talk about using EVs. And the world's largest single deposit of cobalt is found in DRC Congo. So what does the ecocide law mean for DRC? It means if this law is up in time, it will dictate how this mineral is mined, how it is going to be mind affecting uh, the ecosystems, the people there. It's something like a guardrail, which is something we really refer to at Stop Ecocide. It tells them how far you can come. And that's something I think that brings power to the people and back to the hands of the communities uh, that live there. And I'd like to finish with the analogy of, um, okay, you and your neighbor, you decide to plant tomatoes uh, during the rainy season. And you're so affixed with your tomatoes and they don't go all the way good as your neighbors. But every morning you just come out and look at your ground and you're like, what's happening? What's happening? Why aren't they doing so well? But if you would stop and look across the fence and see your neighbor's tomatoes just doing better, you would realize that you could actually walk there and ask, hey, what can I do to make mine as good as yours? It's a matter of ignoring as I started don't ignore that things happening in Africa are never quite helpful to anyone. Just look over the fence and see what we're doing. Could work for you as well. So don't ignore. Um, just before I throw it back to the organizers, uh, I want to I want to offer up uh, one one last thing for everybody. Uh, I'm just curious. Um, I've learned a lot today. Um, and I'm just curious to hear thoughts from the panelists. Um, is there anything, anything you want to share before we before we wrap up? Anything you maybe uh, learned or inspired from another panelist? How you see ecocide law affecting the work you do? Um, just curious for some closing thoughts. Um, maybe we can go in the order that we we did the the talks. And uh, Dana, would you like to start? Yes, must see. Um... I think a difficult one today in modern uh, society is that uh, making a shift between being a spirit, having a human experience opposed to a human that has a spiritual one. And that's really important because I find beautiful synergies in science, like, you know, roughly 70% of the world being water, 70% of your body being water, the same salinity level of your blood is the same salinity level of ocean water. Your heart is literally the genetic memory of when we were in the ocean. So I think it's important to remember that as we approach this climate change issue, there is a human view of it, but there is also a more ancient one that beats in your chest as well. And climate change has less to do with the world and more to do with you. And when we can, as groups and as peoples, and I believe once communities become empowered, once we can see um, ourselves and we can create a balanced worldview in our heads, then it's just a matter of time before the world becomes balanced again. So this is a human problem. And I think ecocide should show us that we are that generation that is tasked with one of the greatest in the world. But I hope that this panel brought a lot of strength to people's hearts because actually, if we look at things that way, the world needs what's in your heart more than anything else. That's what drives ecocide law. That's what drives, um, I'm sure, a lot of the panelists work and the people who work and the people who are listening today. So let's see. 
Thank you. Uh, Priyanka? Yeah, definitely. I just want to say thank you once again. And I think John, I'll have to agree with you that I learned so much today, especially, you know, I always give the example when I'm talking about climate change, about the flash flooding and how on an annual basis, the same coastal communities are affected, the same informal communities are affected, but they don't see this as climate change. And there's no kind of connectivity between what's happening and the climate crisis, because kids are, you know, pushed out of school to support their families. But this is child labor. Um, children, young girls are pushed into child marriages to support their family economically. This is, you know, infringement on their rights. Uh, vector borne diseases, the health implications, and all the other factors that affect their life holistically are as a result of the climate crisis. But there is no connectivity because of the lack of education and the lack of community building and capacity building programs. But it was also so inspiring to hear from my esteemed fellow panelists about how they are experiencing this in what, as well in their own ways, in their own communities. And it really shows, you know, that after all, and ultimately, we really aren't that different. And we really aren't, you know, that extreme different in the ways that we are experiencing the climate crisis. And, you know, as Debbie said, we definitely can and should learn from each other. And I think that it this conversation should be broadcasted and shared as much as possible, because I think so many people can learn from our learned and lived experiences and, you know, just inspire people to continue advocating their voice and the voice of their communities, the voice of their ancestors and the voice of their future generations, as, you know, our panelists has described today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Wasika, um, do you have any takeaways from uh, from anything uh, or any thoughts on ecocide you want to share before we wrap up? Yeah, well, I just want to also um, extend and express my gratitude for everyone and to be invited um, to come and share some of my story and thoughts. Um, <clears throat> it's a beautiful day here in Metlakatla, BC. And so I just want to send everyone some good thoughts. And um, also with the final thought as well, um, I wanted to share that you know on my journey as soon as people know you're doing a good thing for the water or for the land they'll say hey come over here and check out all this other all this other areas where it needs help you know and so for years i've been brought around to all these really hard to love places all these places where you just want to turn away and you see the land is sick but what the water sick and um what i was always taught is like it's our it's our love love as an intelligence that drives us you know that informs us that keeps us on the right path and um so as much as i've seen the degradation and the desecration of of the land and water i've also seen areas that still remain true that still remain intact and um that are at, like rapidly changing right now but i know that on one side of the of eco side there's the protection that's like cut and dry that's the law that's like you can go no further but i do think there's another side to it as well which is like the prevention piece of like where are areas of land and are places that are so vital to the the larger watershed or the larger ecosystem and how do we um safeguard them you know that's another piece too that i, I wanted to leave with everyone as you think about ecocide there there's that the one side is the protection the law and then the other side is is the protection but it's sort of like the proactive piece as well not just reacting to the trouble that shows up but how do we safeguard before that even happens so i just want to leave you with that and say miigwech yeah thank you thank you and um last but certainly not least debbie uh what do you think uh i think wasako has said uh something we also try to advocate or atone we also try to have at stop ecocide is it's not only going to say stop, 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 but it will also uh, say we want this here for long. So the protection side is always something the law and we're hoping this law will bring to adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage. We're hoping as well it could do that. So my last uh, words would be there's something my friend told me towards the end of last year. And could you imagine if we had... Um, we had to fight so hard to be alive for the rights to life if there was no law that said do not kill 
it's the same thing with ecocide. We're fighting so hard to clean up the oceans, to plant trees, to do what everything we can to save our environment. But there's no law that says the opposite is wrong. So it's a matter of not seeing the law as a last resort. When everything has failed now, let's go to court. But also as a fast response that it can be used to protect what we have. And it will also bring the power to your hands that it is your right that this forest should remain here for 10,000 more years to come. So I think the law gives us more power and as well as enable people to protect what they have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I just want to say that it's uh, been a real honor and privilege to, to get to join you all today. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for tuning in. Um, really appreciate it. I uh, want to thank the panelists. I learned so much. You're all so interesting, so dedicated. And, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you all do next. And uh, with that said, also, uh, thank you to the organizers for putting this on. Really, really great event. Um, really hope everyone learned a lot. And um, over to you, Dana D. Thank you. Uh, there's not much to add. Wow, that was a fantastic discussion. I'm I'm overwhelmed. I'm inspired and I have so many more things that I want to think about and talk about since hearing all of you speak. So um, just before we sign off, I just want to invite the panelists, if any of you would like to put your social media handles into the chat, if you want people to follow you or how they can reach you or any links you'd like to share, um, you're welcome to do that. The chat will close at the uh, when the Zoom call closes. So copy paste or um, take a screenshot. And I see that our e-petition has been shared there. If you are open to signing our petition or sharing that with family and friends, we would appreciate it so much. It is time sensitive. We have less than 60 days to, um, once we launch the petition to have it um, submitted. So yeah, thank you. And thank you, John. That was fantastic. I really appreciate um, you coming on board and facilitating for us today. Yeah, thank you so much.